Welcome to the Demystify Technology Podcast from the Farm Group. Typically, you, you go through the due diligence process. What the world of private equity is. <laughs> right. Can't wait. Demystify it. Welcome to another exciting episode of Demystifying Technology from McLaurin Group. This is Jim Headley. I'm here with Alan Williamson this morning. Good morning. Here we are on a rainy Richmond morning. Holy moly. Way too many of those here as of late, and I think the coasts have flipped. So, while we're sitting in here contemplating the universe and our place in it, one of the questions that we get quite often and that really I could use some clarification on is this whole serverless technology thing, the space that is server serverless. Not sure I'm convinced it's serverless. So what I would really like to understand is I really need some help understanding in your mind what is serverless? How far down the rabbit hole does that go? Is you know, mm-hmm. is it is it completely serverless or is it mostly serverless or is it you know or is it all just a sham? Well, it's not a sham, but I can see what you're thinking there. Uh, no, so so fundamentally, serverless is from the perspective of me, the developer, or me, the DevOps person. I don't have to have servers to manage. Now, of course, we know that underneath the covers, there's a server somewhere, just like when we think about cloud storage, that it's infinite cloud storage, or uh, Amazon S3 is, is infinite data. Somewhere there's a disk spindle that's storing that actual data. Somewhere there's a hard disk and how they shard that data across multiple hard disks, etc. We don't have to think about filling up a terabyte drive. So taking the same philosophy that we're used to now with storage, we apply it to processing. And in the serverless environment, we call this sort of functional program. So instead of me uploading an application per se, and setting up a, a server to, to support that application, what I'm now uploading is small snippets, small functions, and they are literally functions. There, there, are, there are functions that adhere to a given sort of function signature in that I, I've, got a, I've got a hook as to what data comes into me. I, I will do some processing, and I will send the data back out again. Now, for me, I don't have to worry about the server. I don't have to worry about scaling up. I don't have to worry about scaling back down again. For me, I've just got this small functional piece of code. could be anywhere from a couple of lines to thousands of lines, but I just think now in terms of functions and not in terms of applications. So, Hal, that that sounds like a substantial shift from how you would traditionally code. How does coding with that function within the serverless environment change the approach to development? quite dramatically in certain areas and not a lot in other areas. So it really does depend on the type of application or the type of problem you're solving with functional programming. Simple terms, if I have something I need to do to react to something, so for example, if I was to upload a file to a file server and I wanted that file to be automatically, if it was an image, resized, then that would be a perfect example of a functional program. Uh, It's a very discreet, small piece of logic that has to be performed upon an action that is done. Uh, If I'm doing something like on a web request in an API-type driven environment, I can respond by saying, okay, that user wants to load data from a given profile. I can have a functional piece of code that simply reaches into the database, does the select, and return data back to the user in a very discreet manner. Now, is that, as we talk serverless, there are, a few that come to mind, AWS, Azure, and Google, are are they very similar in that approach? And how they absolutely run? are. They've, they've all got similar uh, sort of uh, limitations, which we'll talk about in a moment, and the similar look and feel when it comes from a developer's point of view. From here, now the other thing that you've got to remember is that functional programming or this this notion of serverless environments is not exclusive to the cloud. I can actually, in fact, run up my own serverless infrastructure, dedicate some servers to it in my own data center, and utilize that paradigm in the same sort of manner. So it's it's definitely best suited in the cloud environment, but many people think that it's only for cloud applications, and that's not strictly true. Yeah, I would expect that, uh, or maybe I shouldn't expect, that there would be quite a few 
hybridized approaches to to the serverless, envir- serverless environment. It's it's definitely a, a path that's not trodden as much, but it's still there. And and a part of the appeal with serverless programming, of course, is that if your developer is only interested in in resizing that image, for example, they're no longer having to worry about the whole housekeeping or or boilerplate code that they would normally have to do in order for that piece of code to sit within, say, for example, an application server or a bigger server environment. They now need to just get to that basically uh, plain old simple Java object, Pojo, or, or simple JavaScript function, or Go, or Python, whatever it is. You just don't worry about that little piece of function and not worry about the context in which this guy sits with it. It makes it so much easier for the developer. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I would say the uh, the the fact that you're now not standing up a bunch of hardware before you even have to kick this thing off makes a ton of sense. What's the overhead with establishing the serverless environment? And before you even start writing code and developing in that environment, it, it, I would I would think there's quite a bit of of accessibility and security hoops that you would have to jump through just to stand up a, a say an AWS environment. There is, but there are a number of frameworks and serverless.com is, is one of the more popular ones that, that has taken uh, a lot of the logistics of this away from standing this up. Uh, within the Amazon environment, they're called Amazon Lambdas, uh, and a Lambda does indeed have certain things that it can and can't do. You've got to be able to set it up in the IAM roles in order for it to be able to say, I need to access our RDS box or I need to run this Dynamo query, etc. So it doesn't get a backdoor pass to, to, to security. It, it has to be just like anything else. And in terms of, uh, sort of the, the, the environment setup, the, the API to which you have to conform to is, is woefully simple. Mm-hmm. And uh, particularly in Amazon's case, one of the things that they have done very well is uh, Lambda can be triggered for anything near enough. So it could be a, a CloudWatch event, it could be an API gateway event, it could be an S3 event, it could be an SQS event, it could be an SES event. Effectively, anything that generates an event in the Amazon world, you can attach a Lambda function onto the back of that. So if something happens, then execute this code type sort of stuff. But serverless is more than that. So as part of that, there's you can have housekeeping functions so I need to do some periodic database pruning or whatever it is I need to do, or I need to do some archival of files, or I need to do something that, that is not inherent in the tool that I'm using. So I'll run this piece of housekeeping code over that. And Lambdas can be uh, put on a timer, run once an hour, run once a day, run once a week. And that, again, is a very powerful paradigm because you've effectively got an enterprise cron job that you no longer have to worry about this housekeeping server that runs up or or this bunch of servers that now have to figure out which one's in control so I don't send off this housekeeping task that every server lights up and says, I'm now doing the database pruning tonight, and suddenly you've got multiple machines running at it. So it is truly reduced to complexity when it comes down to uh, uh, managing these type of applications at scale. So you, you bring up an interesting point, and that's the the cost associated with that. You you do you find you're having to be more cautious about what you're calling? And because at, in the end, that affects your bottom line. You're going to pay for processing. You're going to pay for, for space. Do you have to be somewhat, I don't, you have to, you have to give some thought to how these things are actually going to execute or is it, is the cost so inconsequential that you say, just run it all, run it all parallel? In yeah, well, it's it's a fascinating uh, conversation. In the first blush, you'd think uh, this is just another way for Amazon to run up a bill in the background without you realizing it. The reality of the situation is that the the resourcing constraints and the allowances, if you will, are so large that you often keep looking at the Amazon bill thinking, I'm missing a zero here. <laughs> this, why is this so cheap? Uh, we've seen this in a number of engagements that we've had. Uh, the way Amazon bills is quite simple. You're, you're billed for, effectively, the amount of time that your function is executing for, right? And it's billed in 100 millisecond increments up to a maximum of five minutes. So your Lambda function cannot run for more than five minutes. If it's in response of an API gateway, it can't respond for more than 30 seconds. So now you've got a piece of function that can only run for 
30 seconds or five minutes maximum. So that gives you an upper limit to how much that's going to cost. As part of that, Amazon also factors in how much memory does your function need. So when you deploy your function, you basically say, uh, this is the amount of memory that I think my function will need, and they give you some tools to figure this out, so it's not, 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 a, not a surprise. And you're then charged on basically a unit per, per, per memory and per time that you're running. The price is ridiculously cheap. I mean, it's ridiculously cheap. But, again, with anything, uh, you got to do your own math, got to do your own figure out what, what suits for you and what's, what doesn't work for you. My only caution when you're doing those calculations is the number that you come up with will not be as big as what you think it is. And you'll start going through trying to figure out, have I done my calculations right? You probably have. It truly is an inexpensive way of doing computing, particularly when you're doing web type of applications. If you're standing up a front-end API, your API is not hit as much as you think it is. So instead of you standing up a server for an hour, waiting for all those transactions to come at you, instead you build for the amount of times those transactions are actually coming at you, you find that that number is on a real magnitude less than what it would be running up servers. Yeah, that one, that was something that surprises me because yeah, when you start hearing about the fact that you're going to pay for, for the processing, you would think there's, there are a lot of bed bugs in that waiting to, to bite you because you, you just don't know. You don't, because you, traditionally you don't think about, all right, I'm going to stand up a server. I'm going to build this application. You're just making sure it'll run within the constraints of the hardware that you have without, you know, and, and in your mind, you're happy if you're making a hundred percent usage of, of the tool. Absolutely. And, and the good news is, you know, even, even the worst programmer that throws their program into an infinite loop, the worst that's going to happen is five minutes. Amazon's going to cut you off. Hmm. It, it's, it's not like you've suddenly forgot to hang up the phone call. And you're going to be charged for hours and hours and hours of unnecessary processing power. So Amazon knows when to cut you off very quickly. Uh, and it does do it unceremoniously. It really will just boom, stop, dead, gone. It's, it's, it's no longer there. So you have to accommodate for that then, don't you? You really do. For applications that you think you're going to, going to span outside of your, your five minute window. <clears throat> and again, there's, there's techniques to which you can get around that by splitting your job up pushing it onto a queue and then having the queue sort of process those bite-sized chunks. So let me ask you, what, what sort of project should I consider for the serverless environment? The, the classic example where you're going to gain a huge amount of uh, benefit would be web-type applications. And this is anywhere from where you need to stand up an API, where you're needing to do a you know, classic React slash Angular type of application. You're now out of the business of running up web servers and application servers. When you think about the sheer logistics of either whether it's a Docker container or standing up Microsoft Windows servers or Linux servers or Engine Xboxes, whatever your flavor of web is, when you no longer have that, that's a huge swathe of, of management and DevOps. It just simply does not have to happen anymore. You're now concentrating on what does the function at the end of this endpoint actually have to do? You no longer have to worry about provisioning enough servers to make sure that if everybody hits that at once, that there's enough scalability in the system. The, the serverless environment, whether it's Google, Azure, or Amazon, will ensure that there's enough resources underneath the covers to be spun up and spun back down again. You don't really think about the servers underneath the covers, what's happening. You're still charged per execution. Okay. So let me ask you this. When, when you... As an organization, you decide this project is ideal for the serverless environment. Then you have to make the decision around, is it AWS? Is it Azure? Is it Google? And do, does that decision, are you boxed in the moment you make that? Meaning it's a company store. You're not stepping outside of that for anything that you need to do or you are, you know, or is there a greater flexibility? If you design your serverless functions correctly, then you can uh, have a lot of portability between the frameworks or the, 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 the hosters in that respect. Uh, generally speaking, you will go to wherever your mm -hmm. infrastructure is already. Yeah. If you're going new at this, then whether it's Azure or, or AWS or Google, it doesn't really matter. Just stick to one. Get your feet wet. Get a feel for what it is. 
it's it's not a it's not a panacea for everything. So you've got to feel for feel it out for your own applications, etc. In many respects, it, it highlights certain weaknesses in, in architectural decisions or how you've gone about a problem because now you're having to think in discrete units and discrete functionality. So. In, in many respects, it forces you to be good citizens of reusability, clean type code that's focused on one function as opposed to being everything to every person. So that, that's an excellent point. So how prevalent is coding in this environment? Is this just a fad or or people because, yeah, the, the cost savings on this can add up very quickly. And I would think there's a great deal of adoption. It's also a substantial shift in how you're going to do things. How how prevalent is it today? Well, it's a great question. It's one I've been sort of thinking about in the background as well, because part of me says, <clears throat> if I'm Amazon, why am I encouraging this? Because I'm no longer writing you quite the big checks now for all those unused Docker instances and EC2 instances I was spinning up. My bill has been, you know, in some cases, 80% of what it used to be. So where's my incentive from Amazon's point of view for selling me this side of the fence? I think it's lock-in. I, I think it's just getting familiar with, with it. Uh, once you get into that world, you, you start using it a lot more. I don't think it's a fad. I don't think it's – and, and in many respects, I think it could be the shape of, of, of things to come. Given how complex certain coding standards are, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to be a Java enterprise developer, I have a lot of crap I've got to wade through in order to be a good Java Person. I've got to know the Java Enterprise Framework. I've got to know all the ins and outs of that world. I'm going to go Spring. I'm going to hibernate. There's an awful lot of overhead that I have to do. And if all I just need to do is to run these 10 lines of functions to get what I need done, done, then it's so much more attractive. So it's going to be easier for me to bring on new developers without having to worry about the overall ecosystem in order just to make this small change. So for a developer coming in cold, they can manage a code base far quicker than they would do trying to figure out, okay, I, I need to understand the whole enterprise here before I can actually make a change in this spring component in order to affect the bug that has been reported. So I think once the industry as a whole has cottoned on to the the, the side benefits of serverless computing and not just not having to worry about servers, but, but what it means to the development team, what it means to the product team, and what it means to the rapid scalability of features and, 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 and reporting to clients in terms of bug fixes and, and, and small changes like that. There's a revolution here that, that's outside of not worrying about servers. Are there any applications that you would say would not be ideal for this environment? At the moment, probably CPU-intensive applications, stuff that you're churning a lot of CPU on that's going to break up beyond your five-minute barrier. So video processing, for example, right. classic example, you're not going to be throwing a Lambda function at this. Now, you may throw a Lambda function at it to kickstart Amazon's transcoding stuff, but again, you're using Lambda in that instance as a more of a conductor in a wider orchestra. But when it comes down to CPU-intensive stuff or any long-running I.O., Things in lambdas probably are for serverless functions at the moment is not the way to go. So avoid it for those really intensive CPU. And again, most applications can be sliced and diced in such a way that you don't get into that. So, you know, I think for us now that we've 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 gained a huge understanding in serverless and we've done a lot of stuff, I'm I'm often sitting back looking at back at some of my big enterprises I've done in the last ten to fifteen right. years, thinking. Wow, that would have made a huge, wow, God, that would have been much easier and quicker and simpler in, in those days. And that's what cloud's all about. We're, we're continually pushing and moving the boundary forward that, that what we do today is going to feel outdated and clunky in two to three years' time. Right. And when you look back and you think back at how much more efficient you could have been had this existed then, um, it's also important to call out the cost. What what could I expect to pay for this type of service to sit in a serverless environment. Well, let's just say a hundred dollars is going to go a long way really? in Lambda processing. Really, a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars, and I, that's talking a long, long way. Because I can't think of even a piece of software that you'd run on a server whose maintenance would be less than a hundred dollars. <laughs> let alone the hardware mm -hmm. and the people it takes to maintain that environment. Well, I, I'm not. I'm somewhat known to be somewhat tight, as it were, or conservative with <laughs> one's money, yes. Uh, so so what it does do, though, is it it, it, it resets your bar. You know, I, I remember having a conversation with, with you the other week where I said, but that's an extra $20. 
and you just looked at me as if to say, it's twenty dollars. <laughs> so we would be talking, you know, two thousand, twenty thousand before, but now you're arguing about, but that's an extra twenty dollars because you're you're sucked into this world now of, but it's it's only a few cents for me to run this serverless environment for for the days that I'm needing it, and, and so so your new norm becomes. Much less. Yeah, and you could easily recoup that just by reusing your tea bags six times rather than three times, like you do now. It's the drying out period that kills me. That's, <laughs> that's what gets me. Well, Alan, thank you very much. This was most informative, and uh, it's far less intimidating having gone through this conversation. Um, where can I learn more on these types of topics? Well, you can go to McLaurin Group and. Uh, subscribe to our podcast it's uh, now in itunes and google play and everywhere else you get your favorite podcast from. wow that sounds really accessible it's fantastic <laughs> well this is jim headley signing off and alan williamson saying bye-bye bye, bye. bye.